uh, should be really interesting and something that neither Chris and I have ever done. So it uh, should be very interesting. No, I think I said that already. You did. That's really annoying. All right. <laughs> Hey guys, so today we are going to be going to Consolidated Gold Mine. So we're going to be taking a uh, tour in a former mine and uh, we're going to be going underground. So hopefully uh, it should be really interesting and something that neither Chris and I have ever done. There we go, that's where we're taking you. Through that very barred up door for the sake of our tourists but you know here in the south we always say visitors that come to your back door are your most welcome guests so <laughs> welcome to the mine y'all feel free to take photos if you like during the tour and if you have uh, any questions that's fine just speak up good loud where i can hear you there's an elevator back up right <laughs> a glory hole in mining terms this is the spot where they discovered that 22 foot wide gold bearing vein. Uh, so try to imagine the way this looked to our miners in November of 1898. That's when they began hard rock mining here. And at that time, this whole area was filled with white quartz rock laced with pure gold. As a matter of fact, if you look way in the back, down low, you'll see an opening. Today looks almost like the entrance of a cave. Y'all see it down there? That's the spot where they dug out 54 pounds, 9 ounces wow. gold. Now the old time miners have removed all of this ore except up high. If you look up high, you'll see there's a column of rock that goes from wall to wall. Mm -hmm. That still assays out at over 3 ounces of gold per ton. It's still very rich in gold. We've got to leave it up there for structural support. That's right. what holds up the wall of the mine right here. So it's just going to hang over our head and tease us on every tour. That is an actual gold bearing vein. Unfortunately, it's not enough volume to justify reopening the mine today. But that's just what the old timers were looking for. As a matter of fact, if you look in this corner right here, you might see the glitter of a little bit of gold right yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Now this white stone, all they had to do to it is crush it to a powder, and it's pretty easy to extract the gold. But you see how some of this looks rusty? Yeah. Now that's coated with iron and sulfur compounds. We call that sulfide ore. And that requires an elaborate milling process. So in 1899, they built the largest gold processing mill east of the Mississippi River here to process this sulfide ore. And doing that was quite an undertaking. They had to get 75 railroad cars filled with heavy machinery from the manufacturer of Milwaukee to Dahlonega. And if you think Dahlonega is a little bitty mountain town today, think of what this place looked like in 1899. I mean, it was just a wide spot in the road. There wasn't a paved road anywhere around here. Look on the ramps coming down in the waterfall there. That's natural seepage running into the mine. That runs right or shine every day of the year, even during the severe drought last fall, that continued to run. If the entrance of the mine was not open to drain this away, we would be underwater on this day. Now the consolidated mine is a hard rock mine. Everything down here that we're going through on tour was drilled and blasted by the old miners. None of this is a natural cave. And the way they started work down here is with simple hand tools like this. This is a hand drill steel. In order to drill a hole, you put this up against the rock and you simply get it and twist it. Now it's kind of a slow go drilling a hole like that. It's faster, two guys do it, so Jabari is going to help me. If you'll put your right hand on that drill steel, and after I hit it, give it a little quarter turn, okay? And don't worry, I usually don't miss. <laughs> Are you ready? All right, here we go. <laughs> Very good. Man got nerves of steel. You're hired, buddy. All right. As they were transitioning away from the hand tools that we demonstrated around the corner, 
and they're moving them on modern equipment like this. This is a stoke drill. They kind of drill made those holes way out there. And this uh, works like a jackhammer you see out in the street on your drilling up instead of down. But let me tell you, this sucker is heavy. You don't have to hold it up against the ceiling. So concealed in this leg is a telescoping foot. When you plug the air hose onto it, that foot pushes downward, forcing the drill up against the ceiling while you drill your hose. It's long mining out that gold wall. Now the wall in front of you, you call a heading. Normally they drill about 16 holes in that heading, their most common drill pattern. Once they got everything drilled out, they take a drilling spoon like this. You'd reach up in there, rake all that rock dust out, get that hole nice and clean. Then it was time to load them down. What'd you load them with? <laughs> dynamite, exactly right. Brought along an extra piece just in case we needed it. So you take the dynamite, begin putting five or six sticks in each hole, tamp them down good and tight with a wooden dowel rod. Now when you're through, you've got 16 holes packed with dynamite, 16 fuses hanging out. <laughs> now at the end of the day, shift change, everybody's going home. Two guys stay behind to light the fuses. Now, uh, they have longer fuses than I got here. About a six foot fuse in each hole. But that gives you three minutes. So at the end of the uh, day, when they were lighting the fuses, you don't want to be fumbling around with a box of matches trying to light 16 of these. Instead, they would cut another short piece of fuse, maybe about a foot long or so, and you would light the end of that short fuse. Once it's burning, you use that short fuse to light all the other fuses in the sequence you want them to go off. When this one in your hand burns down, you better be done. You got just enough time to walk to a place of safety, and you want to listen to the sound of this going off. Boom, 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 back right where you're standing, and it operated a lot like a bumper car. It had a mass that stood up overhead, contacted an electric wire to keep the battery charged. Now, sir, that device you were asking about, right behind you, ma'am, hanging from the ceiling. Thank you for doing the van of white. That is always helpful. Very good. Now, that rusty gizmo there is the insulator that supported the electric wire. So picture this, running the length of this tunnel, about head height, was a bare copper wire carrying 500 volts, which was directly over that metal rail and right beside the running water. Does that sound a little sketchy to anybody? <laughs> Don't be loud, okay? Only kind of break. Oh, and by the way, if I time it right when I cut it off, you'll hear a nice little rumbling echo that's really cool, okay? Only count of three. One, two, three. When they heard the traditional warning yell that they were going to blast. Does anybody know what that traditional yell is? Geronimo. What's that? Geronimo. Somebody said? Fire in the hole. Fire in the hole. Very good. <laughs> Fire in the hole. So I found through the years doing this, a lot of us have a secret desire inside to yell fire in the hole while you're deep underground. So if y'all will join with me in saying fire in the hole, we'll scratch that each together and get it off the bucket list, okay? So y'all yell with me. Everybody ready? Here we go. Fire in the hole! We're blasting every day. So sooner or later, you're going to have a charge of dynamite that failed to detonate. Yeah. That was especially true in the winter because that straight dynamite actually freezes at about 45 degrees. On a cold winter day, if you don't thaw it out before you bring it down here, it'll smolder and won't go off. When that happens, you can't leave unexploded dynamite in the heading. It's a surprise for the next ship to discover accidentally. <laughs> you know, you got to do something with it. So what they would do is evacuate everybody to the safety room, and they would call the most highly paid man in the mine, the safety man. He would show up with this tool. And if you can see on the end of it, it kind of has a uh, corkscrew or auger shape to it. He would have to go to the hole that held that unexploded dynamite, very gently insert this tool, and ever so carefully twist it in an effort to extract that unexploded dynamite. Well, that sounds pretty risky right there, right? Mm -hmm. Consider this. Typically, the last stick of dynamite in the borehole is the one with the fuse. But crimped on the end of that fuse, is a little metal blasting cap detonator. They're extremely sensitive. And the last thing you want to do is be scraping across that bad boy with a metal tool. 
That's kind of a recipe for disaster. So our safety man has to be really good at his job, or really lucky, or else he gets replaced really fast. And for that, he made a whopping two dollars a day. All right, so we watched the video on how to do this, and so Krista's gonna be the first one to show us She's gonna get some gold. We need a new car. Come on, Krista. <laughs> Wait, okay. All right. So you dip her down in. Yeah. There you go. Now you're gonna shake left and right. Oh, you see the red. Uh, yeah. See the red line. Yeah, I see. Ah. Let's see. So she's shaking slightly forward to the red line, dipping it under letting some of the sand go away. And then she's gonna keep shaking back and forth, doing the same thing to bring the, the sand forward. And then when it gets to that red line, she's gonna dip it under again, and it's gonna push away all the sand, leaving the heavier uh, gold and, and things behind. So it's gonna be that for a while. Here we go. No? no? I don't think it's about the water. I think it's where the sand is. Right? How are you coming along? Good. Doing good. You gonna strike it rich on this one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Regular old prospector. Yeah. It's my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The retirement plan's right here. Yeah. All right, so I'm at a good stopping point, so I got that much left. So we're gonna wait for her to finish hers off, and then we're gonna go up and uh, see how big of a car we can get. My guess is probably gonna maybe enough to put air in our tire. <laughs> Let's see what kind of riches you got. Where are y'all from? Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Oh yeah. Alright, so it's now officially a competition. You versus me. That's right. Whoever has the most gold traditionally buys dinner. That that sounds fair to me. Okay, come on, Krista. Lots of gold. <laughs> I got one piece in here. I got one piece. Oh, that's good. Well, Maybe you get to pick where to eat. <laughs> <laughs> you get three pieces, so you win. Oh. <laughs> we don't know that yet. Excellent. There you go. Good job. You might have some. <laughs> All right. Got three. Ready? Well done. Good job. The best way to look at it is the sockers and look down on it. Oh. And that gold. Wow. All right, so we each got our gold. I don't know how well you'd be able to see that. Yeah, so anyway, that was very cool. So if you guys are in northern Georgia, well, northeast Georgia specifically, definitely consider going here. It was really cool. Lasted about an hour or so. Yeah. And uh, it was $16 a person is what it is. And uh, you go see the tour of the mine and pan for gold and you keep what you find. Yeah. All right, so if you guys like the video, make sure that you click the little like button. And if you really like it and you want to see more of our stuff, uh, make sure you subscribe. And I look, hope to, uh, I can't talk. I hope to see you guys next time.